Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grill Nation show with Jason Grill. Thanks for joining us today on podcast, on uh, live stream, or if you're watching this video on YouTube. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, you're up on social media as well here on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, I'll reshare that as well as we go through today's show. I'm, I'm very happy to have back Jeff Phillips, who's the Senior Vice President of Landmark National Bank. Their website is banklandmark.com. Um, Jeff, it's been a while since I've seen you. Is everything going well in your world? Yeah, things are great. Uh, the family's doing well. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, uh, gymnastics for our girls, so that's uh, taking up a lot of our time for meets. But uh, the business aspect is great. Um, you know, it's really interesting. You come out of what you consider to be a pandemic and you feel like are people, um, you know, still kind of uh, reeling from the effects of, of that. Uh, but it's been interesting. I'd say over the last two months, the majority of our conversations have been around um, business acquisition, like companies buying uh, additional uh, companies, seeing an opportunity there, uh, folks adding uh, equipment, uh, and folks having a, a lot of um, time uh, spent trying to find new space to expand. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's not the uh, not without challenges, but uh, when those are the kind of conversations you're having with folks, it's pretty exciting for what that means for Kansas City. Yeah, for sure, and uh, it's pretty exciting that we can roll our windows down too, right? When we're driving <laughs> around town, as you mentioned in the uh, pre-show. I don't know. Uh, there, there's got to. I'm I'm going to guess that this I could actually put the data to support this, but every conversation that happens on a patio ends so much better than the ones that happen inside. So yeah, I don't know, right? I, I, I'll have to put some data to that, but I, I'm a strong believer in patio conversations. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Jeff Phillips, our guest, Landmark National Bank, uh, each and every month they, they join the Grill Nation show. Um, Jeff, let's talk a little bit about our guest. We're going to bring him on here in a second. Uh, uh, tell us about our guest, Roper, and kind of how you know him, and, and and we'll get into his business here in a second as well yeah. with uh, Signature Personal Insurance. Yeah, so I would consider uh, Roper uh, one of my dearest friends. Um, it started out just uh, we met in a uh, faith-based um, business networking group, um, and uh, really it just kind of blossomed into a, uh, a, a friendship. And uh, Roper and I and uh, one other individual, Lance McCarthy, um, have been getting together every Tuesday morning for coffee to talk about what's going on in our lives. Everyone. For, yeah, for almost, um, golly, I want to say for almost 15 years. Wow. Um, and so they have been, Roper is one of those guys that, uh, you know, is one of those like uh, strong pillar types uh, in my life. Uh, he's also a customer of the bank and is my go-to guy uh, in regards to uh, kind of personal insurance. Um, I might just make a, a quick um, segue, Jason, um, because I think uh, Roper is a good example of this. Um, you know, sometimes uh, business owners have that C-suite for one person uh, and it gets kind of lonely and you wonder if you're missing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, are actually going to host an event um, in April. April 27th, um, where we're doing um, kind of a panel of folks that would be in your C-suite if you were a larger company. So like a, you know, a, a professional HR person, a chief marketing officer, a COO, um, a CFO, and maybe a chief technology officer. And they'll be up there to kind of answer those questions about here's what you should be thinking about in these specific areas of uh, how you leverage technology or your data, your customer data, or in HR, like how do you deal with people that are saying they need relief from work because of mental health, because of everything we've gone through, or uh, a CFO talking about, you know, the different programs that have been out there for government subsidies. So all those types of things, sometimes you don't know about all those because you're a C-suite of one. Uh, we're excited to, to host that. And Roper would be the prime example of somebody that, you know, he's running a successful business, but he's he's kind of doing it on his own. And, and so uh, we're excited to host that on, on April 27th. That's great. And we'll, um, will that be up on your website or I'll share it through my Twitter, Jeff, when you have it? Yeah, we're, uh, we're nailing down just a couple more of the panelists before we send out a, a formal uh, invitation and details on that, but we certainly will sort shortly. That's great. Uh, before we get to our guest, I do want to mention that you can connect with me on Twitter at Jason Grill and at the Grill Nation Show, also on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 
at Jason Grill. And then all of our shows can uh, be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. Also can watch the Grill Nation show uh, with Jason Grill on YouTube if you miss it on the live stream. Um, and, you know, if you'd love to be on the show, we'd love to have you. And uh, please connect with me uh, via the Internet or social media to do that. Um, let's bring on our guest here. Um, let's do this. Roper, let's add him to the stream. Hello. Hey, Roper, how are you? And Roper, it, it's D, it's D Garmo, correct? Yeah, you got it. Yep. Just okay. like it. It's uh, phonetic. Okay. Um, Jeff, I want to let I want to let you guys continue this conversation real quick. And uh, and Roper, uh, welcome to the show. Your website you. is signaturepersonalinsurance.com. Um, you are the founder of the organization Signature Personal Insurance, and Jeff says that he's been having coffee with you for 15 years straight. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. That's a lot of <laughs> a lot of Tuesdays. And uh, yeah, so we know each other extremely well, and are, are very close friends. But I would echo what he said that it's uh, he's the kind of guy that you'd like to have in your corner um, when you have a challenge ahead of you personally or professionally. Um, having somebody there who's calm, cool, collected, and can help you think straight is really, really important. Very much so. I couldn't agree more about him. Um, well, let's hear a little bit about yourself, man. Tell us kind of your about your journey and, and your, uh, you know, how, how you got into this industry and, and what you're up to. Well, um, so the the journey into insurance, the joke in insurance is it's always how did you get tricked into this? Nobody ever dreams as a little boy that you want to grow up to be an insurance agent. Um, but for me, it started pretty early. I took an internship. I, I was a student at Bethany College in Lindsborg, Kansas. Um, I, the summer after my freshman year, I worked in a call center selling Sports Illustrated renewals. And I can tell you <laughs> uh, a bad time to sell Sports Illustrated renewals is during the NBA finals. So, um, yeah, I learned that, you know, direct sales through a call center was not the life for me. It was it made a little bit of money and like had this opportunity the next summer to come up and do an internship here in Kansas city with a firm called Haas and Wilkerson insurance agency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, long story. Long, there's did, a lot did, you of get sell, did you get to sell the footballs that were phones when you were there? <laughs> no, no, we just, that uh, we, helped we just out a little bit. I mean, we all got <laughs> ads for those when we were kids, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> so got up here to Kansas city for a couple of summers before I graduated. Um, met my uh, insurance mentor, James Palmer, who just passed away about six weeks ago, just before turning 90. But he taught me, he used to say he taught me everything I know about insurance, but he taught me more than I know, because I'm certain that I forgot a lot of it. Um, so he, he gave me a, a foot up into the industry, showed me how to be a professional. Um, uh, and so I took a job with Haas Wilkerson and was there from 2000 to 2004. That was started getting the itch uh, to do something a little different and had the opportunity with the help of a client to go out on my own. And so we started Signature Personal Insurance in 2004, 2005 um, and kind of have not looked back. It's just uh, that's what we've been doing for the last uh, 18, 19 years. Wow, that's amazing. And, um, and you know, tell us kind of about that journey, I guess you would have through well, first off, tell us exactly what you all do and then tell us kind of, you know, that's that's kind of what that's 2004, I guess you started, you said. So that's mm -hmm. almost almost 20 years now. Um, tell us about kind of, you know, what you all do and, and then kind of talk about kind of how you've you've evolved over those 20, almost 20 years. Yeah. So um, being able to explain what we do has been a bit of a challenge over the years. Um, we it, the industry calls what I do high net worth personal insurance. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer because I don't really know what the net worth of the vast majority of my clients are. So we've um, honed it down to what we really do is we provide personal insurance, home auto, cars or uh, boats, all that um, for individuals and families who have at least one home insured for a million dollars or more. That's actually what triggers the threshold for the carriers that we work with. Um, and I got to do that, or I kind of got into that space um, just by working into it at when I started out at Haas and Wilkerson that, you know, I always tell the story that I want, in the same day wrote a middle market or a standard market homeowners policy and a high net worth market policy. And the, the latter was higher premium, easier to write, 
client was happier, better coverage. And so I just have spent the last, the rest of my career, essentially for most of my career, um, just dialing up that notch and say, go after the next bigger one, the next bigger one. Um, so today uh, we're an independent agency. We represent, well, I mean, there's four, primarily four of our uh, carriers are uh, Chubb, AIG's private client group, Pure, and our newest partner is Vault. Um, and those are all direct competitors that have products that are geared towards families that have at least one home insured for a million. Our clients are national, literally 46 different states. So we kind of follow wherever the opportunity is. Um, and for those states that we're not in, most of them we'd be willing to enter with the right opportunity. Well, you only have four left, right? So <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm not need sure to about Louisiana. It's, it's knocking on some doors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you said it's hard to kind of explain sometimes what you do and then how you got into it. I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that that nobody really likes. Uh, nobody nobody is excited really to kind of give money for insurance, but it's so important. We, we know it's so important because when you do have something that happens, boy, it's nice to have it. And, uh, and, and whether it's, you know, the, the insurance you provide or other types, it's, I, I've had it happen once and it's, you just think, you know, you're, you're, everything's great. And then something just completely unexpected happens. And thank God you have your, you know, people like yourself and companies like yourself that work with you and help you in those situations. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is part of the challenge of, of talking about, first of all, it's, it's hard to take the time to, to want to know the differences between particular tiers of uh, insurance coverage. But, you know, I, I generally kind of try to summarize it down that if you can understand that there might be an incentive for a company to offer a little bit better coverage to attract the best uh, homeowners to do business with them, you can see that what that what's really happened over the years is uh, Chubb innovated and said, why don't we create a, a product that is specifically for these larger homes? Because a, a million dollar home or a $10 million home is not exponentially uh, more of a risk than a hundred thousand dollar home. Those smaller homes have a lot of risk you know, in relationship to their size. And so you get the larger, better built, better maintained homes. The carrier can justify offering better terms and coverage. And the thing that is counterintuitive is it's most of the time, I mean, sincerely, most of the time, it's not more money. Uh, it's just better coverage. And often it's for less, uh, you can pay less because you have the options are a little bit easier to uh, customize for the kind of homes that we insure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think about it, Jason, a little bit like, um, you know, in different areas of your life, you come to um, think that, hey, if I'm going to focus on this thing that I'm doing, my family or my career, I can't be an expert in everything um, and may not want to be. Um, and so you have, you know, maybe somebody that manages your retirement or you have an accountant or um, you have a great banker. Um, but you, um, but, you know, I think Roper is one of those guys that, uh, takes a holistic look at what you're trying to do. Right. So it's not, Hey, you need to have life insurance so you can check the box. It's like, okay, well, let's look at your financial picture. Do you need to have uh, this kind of coverage from a liability or umbrella standpoint? Um, if let's say worst case scenario, something did happen with this house, this is, this is what, um, you should expect, you know, type thing. So really having an expert to, to think about what your specific situation is and then come at it with, here's here's the route I think we ought to go and actually give you a recommendation versus just a off the box, here's what it is. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's where the um, he's really kind of made his uh, market is uh, the folks that are looking for that kind of relationship or are um, willing to do business with him. Yeah, you know, I, I read your website, you know, signaturepersonalinsurance.com and I see a lot of, words like curation and customized and uh, protection. And, you know, it sounds to me that you've, you've kind of found a niche and kind of more of that, uh, you know, things that people want, frankly, they want to, they want to have a plan that fits them and not just isn't a cookie cutter. Option. Yeah. I always say we're a niche within a niche. Um, so one of the things that's a bit unique about, you know, I'm here in Kansas city um, reaching nationally, the vast majority of our clients, I said, uh, I say our, my, my brother's my uh, lead salesman, 
Um, he works with me. He's an, actually an Andover. But we have, you know, met maybe 1% of our clients face to face. Um, most of our clients, um, we initially meet them and have phone conversations to build relationship rapport, answer questions. And then we pivot and transition to a very transactional relationship where they're asking questions and we're given written answers with all the background information they need to make a decision. We used to say that, uh, or we do we still say that our, our goal is to help create informed decisions. Um, I don't love in my, in my industry, we talk about being risk managers a lot. And I always joke, I've never told any of my clients not to do the risky thing that they want to do. And it's usually buying a boat that goes a hundred plus miles an hour. But, uh, that, so really... that is something that um, that you can consider risky. I, you know, whenever you have a boat, there's just a lot of risk, right? Yeah. I like when other people have boats that I can use. By use, I mean sit in them once a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah <right. laughs> so you know, but I, really, what we're doing is professionally working through a process of helping them ensure what is insurable um, or transfer that risk off if it's possible. Um, and we do. I mean, there's some of that where we can talk about. The ramifications of buying certain types of cars for your kids and um that's good you know, yeah i mean those those are the kinds of conversations we can have and we'll work with clients to think about uh it's a it's a bit of a, a trap that you can get into of needing to buy a, a safe car but if it, the higher the value it is the more the insurance is going to be for a teenager and odds are they're going to wreck it they're going to back into a pole that's just the way it goes so that kind of conversation we can Or they have can with... get a ticket or they could get, you know, I mean, there's yeah. things that I did when I was, when I had my license that I think back to now, like, I'm like, and I was a pretty straight laced guy, you know, let's see if I can get this thing up to hundred miles an hour on I-29, usually not the brightest thing in the world to do now yeah. that I look back on it. But, you know, yeah. back then it was like in high school. Just wanted to see what, see what it could do. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I, I was with you. And so well, let me yeah. tell you, my Mercury Topaz could get up to hundred miles an hour once in a while. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hey Roper, you, uh, you touched on something that I think is interesting for your journey. So you talked about your um, brother uh, being in Andover and you talked about uh, kind of dealing with customers via email as well as on the phone. And um, I mean, you, you have employees, you have a business, um, mm -hmm. but it is, practically all virtual, right? Yeah, it is. And it has been. So I, I felt pretty smug when everybody uh, started moving home to learn how to do remote. And we've been remote since 2004. So um, wow. I, I, I dialed it back a little bit when I realized, wait a minute, that means my office is now occupied with children and a spouse who's trying to teach her class from home. So I felt the strain of uh, everybody being in this same space. But yeah, we've been virtual um, I used to, I, before the phrase virtual, I always said location independent. It didn't matter as long as I had a laptop and a cell phone, I could work. Um, and so that's the way we've been. And frankly, we chose tools and resources to make that possible all along the way. Um, so it's myself and uh, my older brother Remington is a salesperson for me. He's in Andover. Crystal is my right hand. She's uh, in uh, Salina. And then we've got a smattering of other people. Um, Courtney's down in Wellsville. I've got a Julie out in um, Colorado Springs. Um, there's a whole side tangent about I've got a friend who is lives and works in China um, that uh, so I have him doing overnight processing for us. Um, Sounds and, like you got this nailed down. I mean, the process, I mean, you're above your, your speed and time with the uh, the remote work and you know, it sounds like that has helped you grow your business, frankly. It's um, it's allowed us to be flexible and work with the types of clients that um, really benefit. So, uh, you know, keeping overhead low means that we, when, when I'm not going to say we're particularly choosy about clients, but um, we work with a, a very specific set of, or a niche. And if you qualify for this niche, then my job is easier and, and you're going to be happier. And so we haven't had felt the strain of trying to, do more types of things we can stick with what we do um and so yeah i, I think that being remote has been a benefit and and it kind of we're we're pivoting into something that i'm very excited about you know i got into this industry um through an internship program um and i'm back on the board of my alma mater bethany college and saw a number of students um 
well, we just know this is not just that small colleges, all colleges students are having a hard time paying their bills and staying in college because of the, the cost of college. And it, it really got me thinking about that gap that they were trying to close of five to $10,000 to finish college, which is somewhat unsurmountable um, if you don't have a job. But if you divide it by $15 an hour, you can very easily earn five to $10,000 and, and close that gap. So for the past little over a year, we've been piloting a program where we're um, bringing on um, students and giving them the kind of work that they can handle. Um, they're not doing a, a very much insurance work, but a lot of what we do is move data around. So uh, you know, students are pretty good at being able to move data from this system into that system in an orderly fashion. Um, so we're giving them opportunities like that. And we're trying to scale that program a little bit. We've got three, I'm about to add a fourth, uh, add in a manager for them. And then I'd like to have five in the fall and, and just start growing it because I know it's uh, good for them and it's good for us. That is your uh, Kansas intern program. Is that what you call it? Yeah. I'm calling it our, our signature work study program. Okay. Um, but most and, of these and, people are coming from close to you, I'd assume at this point, but maybe they're, maybe when you grow, you'll have them all over the country. Yeah. There's nothing to stop it. Frankly, the, the thing that is challenging is breaking down the processes that we do. You know, I used to get in this little trap where I'm like, well, what we do is complicated or it's complex, but it's not that complicated, but it is like to understand the terminology takes, it just takes exposure over time. You have to understand what all the things are, but um, the challenge in, in working with students who don't have any in industry knowledge is breaking it down to components that they don't have to understand. So you don't need to know what this number is. You just need to move it from this box to that box. And so as we build out those processes, and frankly, that's what's happening in our industry anyway, with lots of out, you know, overseas outsourcing and, and things like that. Um, we're not, we are, we will be innovative in how we're doing it, but the fact that we're doing it uh, isn't like breaking the mold. So I feel good about that. It sounds like mentorship is important to you. Um, and I know a lot of business owners are out there hearing what you're saying about all the work you got to put in. And it's like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to keep running my business. I'll handle all this stuff myself. Why is, why is this important to you? I mean, I know you mentioned the, the student loan and all that, but you know, mentorship, talk about mentorship, talk about some of your mentors uh, and, yeah. you know, some of the groups you're engaged with as in the mentorship world. I fell into amazing in, uh, mentors uh, along the way. So I mentioned Jim Palmer, who uh, we, he spent what at, in, in the summers. And then at, once I was full time, we, we just do lectures. It was two and a half hours in a conference room being lectured about insurance, which doesn't sound super exciting until you realize you had to be paying attention to be able to answer the question. So you didn't fall asleep. Um, so he pushed me hard and taught me a lot and I, I'll never be able to pay that back, but I can pay it forward. Um, I had a, the gentleman who set up the program, his name's Fred Dunn. Fred had a passion for, uh, pulling, trying to pull college students into the industry. Um, ever since I've been in the, we, we've had this, I, I think because, uh, our industry is, a lot of second career, the average age of insurance professionals is pretty high. And so it always looks like we're about to age out. And so there's always a push to, to reach down for younger um, professionals and, and teach them. But for me, it is, it is about that. It's that someone gave me an opportunity, taught me uh, a set of skills, taught me how to be professional, and and maybe more important, that gave me the opportunity. Um, so it, I when I'm working with my students, we, we are working on three core values of um, opportunity, choice, and gratitude. Um, so I, I've been saying, look, we'll create opportunities. And that, I don't, I frankly don't care if, if the opportunity end up being an insurance or not, but um, I can give them a chance to do some work that's meaningful for me. I can justify paying them to do it. Um, that'll create better choices for them to take responsibility for themselves going out into the world. And then we just sit back and wait for gratitude. And, and I know that pays dividends. So um, that's the flywheel that we're trying to get going. Yeah. Uh, you know, Roper is also, um, you know, one of those guys that I think identified early on that there is a lot to be gained by being involved in groups that challenge you. And, um, you know, either 
um, to think differently or to um, focus on a specific area of your business or personal life. And so I know um, some of those, he also knows himself to know which of those come naturally and which of them don't. Um, and he's put himself out of his comfort zone uh, in different scenarios to join groups. Um, so I didn't know, Roper, if you might. Um, I think I think that's something that others could take away from it is uh, you're good at it, but it doesn't come naturally to you about, you know, maybe like joining uh, Acumen or Centurions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, finding resources. So, you know, I, I decided to go out on my own in 2004 to start a business and looked over the, you know, down the road and I'm like, wait a minute, there's the Kaufman foundation. They seem to have programs for that. And I felt like this is, I mean, I, I started down that track maybe six months into my career and that was good because I had, I knew what I needed to know then. I'm like, I need to fill some some uh, knowledge gaps. So Kaufman filled that for me for, you know, the first 10 years uh, of, well, maybe, yeah, of, of my career. Uh, the Centurion's Leadership Program was a great opportunity to, I feel like, really challenge myself by being around really talented people. Um, Jeff and I were in that program together, and it, it really helped me. Um, understand what it means to really strive and be, want to work hard and to be professional. So that was one group. And I've just recently in the last, you know, I guess it's like three months ago, I joined a, a group called Acumen, which is, um, I just couldn't be happier. It's a, a, a faith, there's a faith component to the leadership program. Um, but being in the room with a dozen other business owners that are as passionate about their business and their numbers as I am about mine. And like the comforting thing is someone shares something and somebody else is doing the math of, well, that would be 5,000 times 20. I'm like, all right, so I'm in the right room. I'm with the right people because we're thinking about the problems the same way. Uh, but it's encouraging. Um, and it's great to have a place to have people challenge you then too and say, you know, are you really doing what you want to be doing? Let me ask you this. Um, you're obviously a guy who works in an industry where um, – the word risk is 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 talked about a lot. Um, what of any risks have you taken with this business since you've been working at it the last twenty years or so? That's a great question. Yeah, um, you know, I'm 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 uh, I've pledged that I'm not going to do any more all in bets. Um, but the biggest all in bet would have been in 2006, and it is, I mean, it is a part of what pulled us nationally. Is I had a, an account executive who worked for me here in Kansas City. Um, he moved down to Florida and at the time he was, um, he told me, yeah, they're hiring me to come work at this agency and, and work internet leads. And it's hard to remember back to 2003 and, and how absurd that sounded. Um, but where were we at at that point? We, we didn't have Facebook yet. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have, I think YouTube was just starting or it was maybe in 04, 05. We definitely didn't have a thing where you could just like LinkedIn yet, or if we did, it was, no one was on it. Uh, yeah, I, I joke that so Gmail came out in 2004. Yeah. Um, and so that that was when we remember when you got, an invitation, you got an invitation to join Gmail, you thought you were like some special person, yeah, <laughs> you know, like 20 years ago. <laughs> wow, my Hotmail and Yahoo account, I don't have to use my AOL.com anymore. Wow, yeah. now everyone has one, they do. And, and unless and, they're old school, there are people that that will not leave their Hotmail or Yahoo account. As you I sort of want to go back and get it. I got, I have plenty of clients who have an AOL account, but oh, yeah. uh, my, old man, my old man still uses his. And I'm wondering to myself, you know, you used to pay for that. I, I don't yeah. know if he still pays, but it's who knows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, it's, it is hard to rewind and think about what the world looked like, but the, the, when the idea of paying for opportunities that come from the, the internet was very out there at the time. In fact, well, and so he talked to me about what he was doing. He started it and he showed me his numbers of what he was actually producing. And I'm like, wow, okay, I got to give this a try. And I, I talked to the insurance or the, the lead aggregator about what we do. And I said, I'd love to buy leads, but they don't do me any good unless the dwelling limit on the home is a million dollars or above. So they said, we can well, do you that. always had a million then too, Roper? Yeah. Yeah. So now today you're at the same as you were, as you were then. Entry, right. And now houses are even in Kansas City. It's like, you know, a million dollar home three years ago used to be a mansion, and now it's like people are selling their homes for 
Yeah, you know, it, that that is a, a side conversation about the, the difference between market value and reconstruction cost. Uh, and and it had it's part of what makes me a little unique in being specialized in high net worth in Kansas City. The construction labor and material costs in Kansas City are dramatically lower than you might imagine in New York and mm -hmm. San Francisco and um, up and down the coast of Florida. Um, Sorry to interrupt you there. That was just no, no, it's about the whole time. I was like a million dollars at home. I'm thinking to myself, you just mentioned that in 2004. Those yeah. were some very rich people. I I do some, I, I hope he doesn't ever see this, but I, the, the <laughs> founder of both AIG's private client group and pure two of our um, companies, that's one of, I got to meet him when I was at Hawes and Wilkerson and they came in talking about their target market, our homes a million dollars and above. And I was too young and dumb to realize I was supposed to be in the room and not talking, but I asked questions. Um, and one of my questions was, it seems like a million dollars isn't your target. That's your the, bot, the entry level. Your target must be higher than that. And so having that opportunity to see that product roll out, and of course, the target market is higher than that. I will tell you, I've learned over time, though, that my, my target market has a ceiling. Uh, we divide our network into high net worth and ultra high net worth. And I have a handful of truly ultra high net worth uh, individuals. And it's not that I can't take care of them, but it, they're less likely to have been abandoned or not being well, well taken care of. So our, we have a, uh, there's no like hard number. It's just a feeling of the type of client. Um, if you can go buy a place in Miami with no um, mortgage and you need it bound in 12 hours, that's not necessarily my cup of tea, but. Um, hey, I got to be honest with you. I was in Miami about three weeks ago, and it's very hard not to look at a potential house down there when it's uh, when it was nine feet of snow on the ground or nine inches of snow here. And it's now I know it'd be hell to live there through what I guess May through whatever the summer months are. But just, it is just floating. Favor. I might have to call you if I ever reach that. Call me before you make an offer because that really good deal is probably uninsurable. That's why it's a good deal. So <laughs> I, I, I can speak from experience. I could talk to you forever. I, I feel like Jeff, we're learning so much from Roper. I don't even know if we even got to the point of the uh, risk. Yeah, I know. I want to hear about I this know. all in bet the on all in bet. Yeah. 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 So the all in bet, you know, you, fa is you find out about um, this internet leads thing and I tell them what I, what I needed. And they said, yeah, but we'd have to create a custom filter. And in order to do that, we need you to commit to $10,000, a $10,000 buy from us. And I'm literally a one man band at that time. I had no employees. It was my money, nothing else. Um, and so um, I looked at my bank account and there was nothing there. And I looked at the credit card that had a $10,000 limit on it. And I thought, yeah, I can make this bet. And so we I pulled the trigger to start buying leads, thankfully. They didn't fill the ten thousand dollar buy that that they thought they could do, but uh, literally the first lead we purchased was somebody relocating from San Francisco to Austin, and he started his insurance shopping online, and it just clicked. I'm like, oh, that's who shops for insurance online. People who made their money from um, internet or businesses that were technology based, and of course today, it, in our industry, like ninety percent of um, insurance review processes start with an uh, internet search. And I kind of wondered what, what are the other 10% even doing? They're probably asking their neighbor who doesn't necessarily have a very <laughs> large grasp on the, on the whole market. But yeah, so that was a big bet. Um, but it was a big bet that proved the market that told me what I, where I could fit in. And that's the a bit of a, the niche within a niche too, is that we're working with individuals that are not, otherwise connected because obviously everybody knows somebody in insurance. Um, but there's lot the various reasons why someone would reach outside their network for their own insurance, like relocating across the country or um, things like that. So mm -hmm. Roper, how do you approach that now? I mean, here you are, you know, 20 years later and um, it's not the dollar amount so much as it was maybe at the time, like that was a huge number and it almost seemed like insurmountable, you know? So it was like, yeah, I'll bet the farm because like, you know, the farm's only worth this much, but now, I mean, you have a business that is, has real market value, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have, uh, you're at a different point in your career to where, Hey, at some point I'd like to not do this forever, maybe, you know, so I'd like to stock some money away. So how do you, 
approach that now? What, what's your kind of decision filter for whether or not something is too big of a bet? I think I have to be honest and say that I started, I thought I was just going to start taking chips off the table maybe three or four years ago um, and stay small and profitable was the plan. Um, I didn't need to be big. Uh, there's no ceiling to how big you can grow an insurance agency if you want to invest the money to do it. Um, but I've never, the, th the thing I'm learning how to do is be a leader. Um, I've never really wanted to lead or manage people. Um, so I just hired people who were uh, self-starters and self-disciplined and put it, let them do their thing. Um, but as this idea of working with students has come along, I have a, a it gives me a reason to want to grow. Um, I'm starting to understand that I have a knowledge set and a market access that can be leveraged for the opportunities of others. And so that's, you know, you, you say, what are, what am I willing to bet? And the financial side is not that hard um, because again, like I've got a good banker, I've got a line of credit. <laughs> so I can cover, I can cover the, the, the cost of a bet on a, uh, a person or an idea uh, what's been a little harder is it's not hard. It, it's mostly time. It's a, it's a lot of work to train people um, and the sort of build a program while people are in it. So that's been a challenge. Um, but I mean, hey, working with about working at something that you have a passion for is so much more fun than just trying to make a few extra dollars. Yeah. So I think uh, you said something there that sparked something in my mind. Um, you know, when you're kind of in hand to hand combat growing a business, it the things that you're doing are resulting in growth or revenue. Right. So mm -hmm. it's kind of easy to rest your head at night knowing, OK, the things that I did uh, increased revenue or made my business better. Uh, I feel like over the last year, you have focused on things that don't have a next day impact on revenue, but mm -hmm. are critical to your organization. And I'm thinking specifically about how you have been able to kind of crystallize your message and your vision about who you are as an organization and what you're going to focus on and where you're going to dedicate resources. Can you talk about if that was completely a miss, a miss on my part or if that's no. uh, what's going on in your world? Yeah. And so obviously Jeff and I've talked about this, uh, some of this stuff, um, but I let's see, it must have been in 20, 20 we read simon sinek's infinite game uh, you know what uh, back up i got to see simon speak in new york in february of 2020 so rewind a little bit and say wait a minute where were you and what did you bring back from new york um but um so i i listened to his his presentation on infinite game thought it was uh intriguing enough to uh do a book study with uh, a couple people in the business with me and we started through that book um, and, you know, fast forward to the end and we keep looking back and I felt like we stepped in a big pothole on a just cause. Um, the, it was clear that we we understood what it meant to, to run an infinite game, to think long term or think about building systems that can last. But I couldn't even in a little bit articulate uh, a just cause that was worth sacrificing for. Um, and so we kind of sat with that for more than a year, frankly, like, what are we really doing this for? If it's just for money, um, and honestly, if it's just for money, that it makes more sense for me to roll my operation into a much bigger operation where I can have more resources and scale and all that. But, you know, as we started thinking about the, the reason that the people that work with me now, my current team, why do they work with me? It's that flexibility. Um, and we like working with each, with each other. Um, so that just all of a sudden clicked that that's the, that's really what we're about is giving opportunities. And so, you know, matching it up with students and realizing I have a, a passion for giving. I mean, I felt like my opportunities came in a strange way that I couldn't have earned on my own. And so I kind of want to find students that uh, maybe need a shot, uh, a, a chance to prove themselves and learn something and, and move forward. So that, you know, you, I think that's what you're getting at is the thing that things that I'm betting on now are, are the long term of that. And frankly, it's it's an intrinsic value thing that everybody responds to. I, 
I, my insurance companies are clamoring to participate. Uh, the students, of course, love it. My employee team loves it and clients. And that frankly, you know, I, I should have just led with it. So our target market are individuals and families who have one home insured for a million dollars or more and value that we work with students um, because it's going to slow us down. Um, but in the end, you're taking care of something that you have to take care of anyway, and you can do some good along the way. And you've been going through a lot of visioning, um, you know, it sounds like, and efforts to kind of just take yourself to the next level in all these different ways. And what does that process look like? I mean, is that a is that a weekend retreat or is that, like, you know, you're talking to Jeff at coffee every Tuesday and he's giving you kind of what he thinks. What does that look like? Well, honestly, it's obsessively thinking about the same question over and over for five mile run every other day. Um, but no, that you got a I runner can, here. I like that. Yeah. That's a good time to think about these things. Yeah. So I had honestly never heard the, the phrase EOS entrepreneur operating system until that's not fair. Jeff gave me the book probably a long time ago, and I, I realized it was a textbook that needed. You're supposed to do the work as you write, read it. So I set it aside because that was hard to do while you're running. Um, but then uh, getting back to it and realizing what EOS really was about and understanding there were tools in there for organizing your thoughts on one year, three year, five year plan. Um, that's really been our process of thinking about it gave me a some insight on how I could not just grow my business by me doing more, but by building out the resources and finding the right people to do each piece of it um, and and sort of scale that way. So uh, that's been a big part of it, and we're we've been working through that for the last probably six months, uh, and it's been really helpful to be able to look. I still can't look ten years out; that's too far for my entrepreneurial brain. But five years feels pretty. Uh, solid. Well, then good segue to your uh, top goal for 2022. I mean, now we're in March now, so now we're out of the winter time almost, but have you accomplished your goal for 2022 or are you still working on it, Roper? Uh, still absolutely working on it. I mean, there are some structural things we're working on within the business um, about getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. Um, so that I think we'll have wrapped up uh, within the next 30 to 60 days. But my top goal is to have five students doing meaningful work at a meaningful wage uh, come fall. Um, and if we can do that, I know that means that in the next year we can have 10 and probably, you know, three of them will have experience and they can start to train each other. Um, so that's the goal for the year. We have revenue goals. Of course we have revenue goals. Um, and those are not very hard to strive for because winning is fun. <laughs> so uh, but setting the goals on the things that uh, require uh, time, attention, effort, uh, that's that's where my head is right now. And it's all remote too, right? With the students. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that clicked with the, 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 the pandemic helped me out a little bit. I've been saying this for years that most jobs are can be componentized and done remotely. Um, but I think it gains traction when you everybody you know, with a flip of a switch went home and figured it out. Um, so part of what we're building is we're piloting it around insurance, but this is something that I think is available for virtually every industry. There's something that is happening in the back office that could be better done uh, by a student who needs the opportunity to learn the skill and the trade. Hmm. I agree with you. Um, best personal and career advice you could share with this as we, uh, we get some more of our uh, less intense questions here down the stretch. Client once this would have been like 2000. Uh, I don't. I don't remember actually 2010 or 12 or something like that. I started getting an itch to I you know looking around at my client base and realizing the level of wealth that I had connection to and thinking, man, I ought to be doing something in financial services, not just insurance. And he smiled and said, just stick to your knitting, like do your thing, like <laughs> not not that you wouldn't be able to figure it out. I don't think he was trying to be. Um, derogatory to, towards what I could do, but he was being pretty clear that what I ought to do is what I do really well and, and stick with it. And so that was, it was advice well received at the right time. That's great advice. Um, what about personal? 
That's tough. Eat with Jeff, run 10 miles. <laughs> no, you don't have to give me a uh, You know, no, I think I think that what I would say is having people in your life who actually uh, know you and can uh, hit the BS button uh, on things that you're saying. So, um, and challenge you. Um, that's really important. I, and so that's having not just friends, but people who you're willing to be vulnerable with. That's the, mm. that's been a life lesson. Yeah, like one that. of the things I think, uh, Roper, um, that, you know, you have to be in those type of relationships, you have to be willing to uh, uh, take that kind of uh, stuff, but you also have a responsibility to give it right, which can be somewhat uncomfortable sometimes. And so um, there might have been a recent experience of that, Jason, where Roper had to deliver some news to me about, hey, if you say this is important, then do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I like that. Um, what are some of the biggest industry industry issues uh, right now oh, in 2022? Don't buy Don't a place too far in the weeds of those. Like, no, I'll, I'll keep it high level, but um, there's so sad to say for all of us, uh, insurance rates are going up. Like they're just going to go up. Um, mm -hmm. It was a rough couple of years for major storms, wildfires, but believe it or not, it's the hail. The hail is, is, is really, um, really killing the, the property insurance market. But so challenges in my space, um, California. But on the other side, people are making more money now, which means they're going to have more Oh, and uh, jewelry and, uh, you know, the economy minus inflation is pretty strong. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think there's plenty of opportunity. The The challenge we face, though, is clients uh, finding, I joked with you, the great deal in California, Colorado or Florida. And mm -hmm. the great deal might be because the insurance on that's going to be twice your mortgage. So like that's something uh, you don't think about. And that, yeah. I'm so happy we had you on because now. I, I just, I, that's flipped it on my head. You know, there aren't any yeah. great deals. You got to do your due diligence. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it, it, it can be, um, I have clients who have opportunistically purchased homes in Florida that the wind insurance is so expensive that they don't want to buy it, but they can also justify not. If you can afford to go without, don't call your banker and ask for a mortgage on a home that doesn't have wind insurance. But, um, if you can afford to go without, no, that, you can spend the money on shutters and good protection and, and hope for the best. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a thinking a condo might be a better choice here, Jeff. <laughs> new, the newer, no, the better. Okay. Not a good choice. No, Maybe no, I'll no, just stay in Kansas city for 12 months a year. Then from now on, uh, James, pretty Palmer, easy here. James Palmer gave me good advice, uh, almost every, at every corner, but he said, Roper, take your family on vacation every year, go someplace nice, go someplace for as long as you want and relax and give the keys to the owner when you come home. And he made it very clear that you don't want that home on the coast. You just want to go visit and then come home. So uh, I like that's that. my, that's some good advice. Mm -hmm. that's some really good advice. Um, okay. So in, it, it, the insurance rates are going to go up. That's good to know. They're going up and, and any place that's wildfire, you know, any place that is wildfire exposed is going to start to be a challenge. So all over uh, Colorado, Montana, um, Idaho, these are all places that are, are really those are, those are places that are growing, you know, people yeah. are moving to those places. Yeah. And it's beautiful to have a big, beautiful house back in the woods, but that is what we've learned in the last three years is when the fire decides to go a particular direction with a hundred mile an hour wind, it's going that direction kind of no matter what breaks you've put in. So um, the, the market's going to be tough for the insurance on those, but I, again, I'm not a. I, I don't really think of myself as a risk avoider. Uh, just know that if you're buying a place in the forest, you need to evaluate that risk. Mm -hmm. So people's risks. We're, we're we're fairly lucky here. We got tornadoes, I guess. But um. yeah, for the for the most of us, what we really and maybe this would be simple advice everybody could take. Um, you could go look into automatic water shutoff valves. They're likely to start being required by insurance companies. We're talking about all these big disaster things that can happen, fire, hurricane, earthquake, those types of things. But the thing that's much more likely to happen is the supply line to your toilet breaks and floods three floors. Mm, uh, nothing, that happened to me recently. Yeah. Just a drip, a little drip in the ceiling <laughs> from a plumbing issue could cost you five, six, seven thousand dollars that you were not yeah. expecting. Yeah. So a uh, water shutoff valve takes, keeps it, uh, you know, it just senses that there's 
movement of water that is a telltale sign of a leak and it flips that switch or shuts that valve off so you can go find it before it, uh, you know, a $5,000 repair becomes a $25,000 repair. I need those in Brookside. We need more of those in the homes in Brookside. Um, coming. Quickly, Jeff, I know, I know we're about at 50 minutes here. I, I love talk. I, this is done great. Um, how about, uh, this is kind of a fun question since you are in insurance. Um, what would you be doing if you weren't in insurance and a business owner? Um, you're going to be like, I, I would have, I would have gone to the PGA. I'm a great golfer and, uh, no, you know, I don't, it, it is so hard to say. Um, honestly, I, I took the opportunities that were presented to me and didn't really look back. Um, I, 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 where I, you know, I grew up not, well, I'll put it this way. We thought we were middle class, but looking back, I'm like, hmm, we were, that was upselling it a bit. So, well, I come from small towns in central Kansas and Nebraska. And so I saw the opportunities and just grabbed them at every, every chance I've got. I had the opportunity in the last month or two to think about what would I do if I had to sell my business for some reason, a, a friend um, had life circumstances put him in a place where he felt like he needed to exit sooner than he wanted to. Um, and that really upset me. <laughs> so I had to think about that. Why did that upset me? Um, and so I have process down. What would I be doing if, if I weren't selling insurance? In some way, I'm going to be working with mentoring people, um, whether it's, I don't think I would be a particularly good coach, like a sports athletic coach, but find a place where you're uh, teaching somebody a skill to better their life. So whether I, I, I'd be doing something like that. You could always be an adjunct professor. There you I, go. It's, you it's on work. the radar. It's on the yeah. radar. You have to leave your house though. Well, you could teach online. You could do an MBA course or something online. There's a lot of local yeah. universities that would probably love to have you. Um, and then I guess, Jeff, you have any other questions? I think, you know, it's interesting to, what is one quote maybe that you, you like to live by that you, that you, that you think's great or a, a book or a quote that you really kind For of. For me? Turn? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is quoting Lou Holtz. So it's uh, our core value. Uh, can I trust you? Do we share a commitment? And do you love me? Do we love each other? I, I always saw, I've been softening that one for years by saying, uh, do we respect <laughs> each other? So I'm really trying to like uh, break out of that because that's, that's the, the, the real heart of it is uh, do we care about each other and do we want good things? So um, that has served me well in virtually every relationship in my life, uh, thinking about trust, commitment, and, and mutual respect or love. Um, it, it, you can generally, if you're having a problem in a relationship, you can generally drive it back to one of those um, and, and you can build from there. Yeah, Lou Holtz, a friend of mine was uh, was at Notre Dame when he became the head coach, and he just told he always tells me stories about Lou Holtz. You know, uh, when he showed up there and got on the podium, he's like, "I'm five nine, I had a lisp, and I'm your new head football coach." I mean, the guy was like, just, just, just you just when you see him, you wouldn't think like this guy is going to just blow blow your socks off as a football coach. And you know that that quote is very powerful. That's a great. Well, quote. He's so, you know, I got to it, out in Salina, Kansas. He came as a keynote speaker for the Salina Chamber of Commerce. In fairness, that was probably my first internship. I did a one month uh, stint with the Salina Chamber of Commerce and got to hear Lou Holtz speak. And by the end of this 45 minute presentation, I was ready to run through walls and fire for the man. So I'm like, no wonder his football team is good. <laughs> like, you're like, in 45 minutes, you can motivate a, a crowd that well. That's, that's pretty good yeah. skill. Very cool. Well, um, Jeff, do you have any other questions? No, our... I think we, I think we covered it. Rover, I, I really do appreciate uh, just your uh, vulnerability and in, in sharing kind of where you are currently and how you got there. And I would encourage folks that, um, you know, if you've kind of set it up in your life to where you said, I'm going to have experts surrounding me to uh, help me navigate all the decisions that got to be made. I, I can't uh, recommend any higher uh, to visit with Roper. And I'll just echo my second layer of qualifications. Find me if you think working with students is important. And because you, you're, if you're listening to this, you're buying insurance already. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at is just giving our students opportunities to work through the process. You know, I'm, I, I really don't care if we write the, the business at the end of it. We know we'll get our fair share if we're getting opportunities. So if you or someone you know thinks you qualify for what we do and 
you think what we're doing is interesting with students, you you can probably find me. The URL's on the screen, but if you can't find me by name, um, that'd be it's pretty and unique name in Google. Forty six states. Yeah, so we'll follow. Oh. You. We'll find you. Let's, let's add the rest of them. <laughs> well, we didn't get into which four states those were, Jeff, but I'm sure we have some friends in one of those states that can help us. We can make it happen. Uh, That'll be our goal for next time we have Roper on. Yeah, Roper. Roper DeGarmo, thank you so much for coming on the Grill Nation show. Owner of Signature Personal Insurance. Their website, again, um, is SignaturePersonalInsurance.com. I want to thank Jeff Phillips, Senior Vice President at Landmark National Bank. BankLandmark.com is their website for joining us today as well. Uh, great contributor to the show. Uh, this was a fun one. Uh, really looking forward to, to talking more in the future. And uh, Roper, congrats on all your success as, as a business owner and as a you know, as a mentor and as someone who's trying to to do a lot of really cool things here in a local community and throughout the country. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Roper. Thanks for everyone for watching or listening today. We will see you again soon. Have a great day.